The following teaching is possible thanks to the friends and partners of Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. Welcome to this, the final session on uh, the topic of prophetic foreshadowing. We've looked at how God uses people, places, things, and now I want to look at events or times because God uses time also in a prophetic way to point to the details of the, the life of Christ, of God's plan of redemption, and future things that are going to happen. One of the things that many Christians have become out of touch, and frankly, it's been very refreshing in the last few years to see how many Christians have become more aware of the feasts of Israel. I think it's a tremendously uh, sad thing that, you know, uh, back in the 300 ADs, that Christians became divorced of our, uh, of our Jewish roots. You know, the fact is, I, I was uh, talking to my dentist the other day, and, you know, he's a he's a, a wonderful man. And he says, you know, I tell all, I remind all my friends, Jesus isn't a Christian. He's a Jew. And looking at him, I said, and, you know, Doc, he still is. He, so, you know, we stand on the shoulders of our Israelite brothers and sisters. And there's a significant thing that God has done. I mean, the tabernacle and all of these things. But one of the things that God did that he gave the Israelites as part of their worship was he gave them feasts. Now, the word feast is the word moed, and the, a, a feast is a moed, and feasts are moedim. And these, a better way to translate that is appointed times. Now, there's throughout the year, the, the, the 12 months of the year, there were times that God said, you will celebrate this feast of Passover, this feast of unleavened bread, this feast of, of first fruits. You know, there's various feasts. But the true significance of these feasts is that they pointed towards future events within God's plan of redemption. They're a foreshadow. So I'm going to give you, um, for instance, let's just look at Colossians chapter 2. Verses 16 through 17, it says, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival. That's the word religious feast, a moed, a, a moed or a moedims, a new moon celebration. You know, I used to think that was some pagan thing. No, they, the Israelites, that's how they determined the beginning of each month is when the first sliver of a moon is, is seen, that's the beginning of the month. So they had to know this to mark the, 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 the proper days to celebrate their feast. And then he goes on, uh, new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. Then in verse 17, these are a shadow of the things that were to come the reality, however, is Christ. They're a prophetic foreshadow. They're pointing to real uh, term, you know, future events that throughout the year they would celebrate the Passover. But the fact was there was a real Passover in Jesus Christ. God established it when, you know, the Israelites were in, in Egypt and the, um, and then the, uh, the, that the, 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 uh, the Israelites got passed over and only the firstborn of the Egyptians died. Well, then he said, you know, you will celebrate this from now on and every year you'll remember it. If you think in terms of these feasts, which I'll, you know, I'll list these off, as these would transpire during the year, they should or were intended to bring the Israelites' attention to God's time frame and the planning and the movement forward through time of, of events that were going to happen. So there was the Passover and then future, the true Passover of Jesus Christ, which has been accomplished. And then there's the, in the year, the next is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then there was the Feast of first fruits and the Feast of Weeks. Now, those are all spring feasts, and they've all been accomplished in Jesus Christ. He accomplished the true Passover, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the, um, the, 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 it, it, to demonstrate without sin 
Then Christ was raised from the dead as the first fruits from the grave. In the same way, they're celebrating this feast of first fruits, and it's marking to the day, pointing to the time in God's plan of redemption when the true Messiah would get up and he would be the first fruits from the dead. And then the Feast of Weeks was the, also known as Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit got poured out. So within this Jewish calendar, all of the spring feasts have actually been accomplished. They've been fulfilled. Jesus Christ fulfilled them. God poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then we go through this period between the end of when Pentecost is until the fall feast. So, you know, three, four months in there, there's a, there's a fairly long stretch. Well, my gosh, it's been almost 2,000 years. So again, that there's a, there's a paralleling here. Then we get into the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths. <coughs> Excuse me. The Feast of Trumpets is a fall feast when they would all blow their trumpets, and there's specific significance to this, and that's the next feast in God's plan of redemption that must occur. When will that happen? Well, there's significant evidence to, to, to point that the Feast of Trumpets will occur when, you know, the rapture occurs, the gathering together, the, the, uh, where Christ comes, gathers the dead in Christ, they rise first, and then those we which are alive will follow right after them, and we all meet Christ in the air. And there's significant evidence to indicate that that will happen on or right at the Feast of Trumpets. Then following that is the Day of Atonement, also known in Hebrew as Yom Kippur, and that is a time of judgment. That would be the time of when the wrath is followed by everyone appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. And then finally, the Feast of Booths is also known as the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's when every man has enjoys his own tent. And, and what the Israelites would do is they would actually set up little booths or tents and they would have a little bit of feast and eating and stuff. It's pointing to the millennial kingdom. It's pointing to a time when every man has his own booth or has his own, his own home, has his own vineyard. And so all of these feasts, again, and I've gone through this very rapidly, but I hope you get the point. God gave physical feasts that the Israelites were to so celebrate throughout the year but those feasts are pointing actually to the plan of redemption, some of them clearly having been fulfilled, all of the feasts of the spring, and we're waiting for the first feast of the fall, which is the Feast of Trumpets. I think this is pretty significant stuff. And when you dig into the details of these feasts, you gain a lot more clarity about what God is doing. They're prophetic foreshadows. We also have... Um, God uses time in the sense of Sabbaths. You know, remember it says that on six days God did his creative works and then on the seventh he rested. But in Hebrews 4, it says, um, beginning in verse 4, it says, For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest. Verse 6. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Verse 9, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And in verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. God has seven days through the week. Six days God, God worked, and on the seventh day there was rest. Those days are significant and they're pointing, they're, they're giving a prophetic foreshadow to the ultimate plan of God that on the seventh day, those that seek it will enter God's rest. You know, so God uses, you know, God uses days. He used this. My point is here that he's using events or time. And, you know, God um, relates to time differently than we do. You know, remember 2 Peter 3, 8, don't forget, that, my dear friends, that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. So you can go back and break down the weeks of the day, and there is also a prophetic foreshadowing that is going towards the, um, the millenniums or the millennia of time. If we look at the records of Adam and creation, 
that it, it uh, gives us about 6,000 years. Adam being created about 4,000 and some odd years uh, BC. We, this is 2014 AD. That's about 6,000 years. I have the dates. I don't want to get into the specifics. There's debate over exactly which is which, and that's not my point. But I just want to give you a sense here. On day one, on the day of creation, on the first day of the week, light appeared. And in the first millennium, Adam's sin separated him from God's light and evil increased. On the second day, there was a separation of the waters above and the waters below. And in the second millennium, you know, day two, it can, you know, if you think in terms of a th the second 1,000 period year, the waters above and the waters below were used for judgment. On the third day, plants yielding seed were created. And in the third millennium, a promise was made to Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. On the fourth day, the lights in heaven were created. And in the fourth millennium, kings and prophets were given as lights to Israel and the light of the world, Jesus Christ, was born. Can you see the parallels that, that we can see? You know, these are just not coincidental. You know, we're looking forward towards a future time when there will be a seventh millennium, and that will be the 1,000 millennial uh, year kingdom. And that's why it says, on the seventh day God rested, and in the seventh millennium, the earth will be restored, man will rest, and it'll be a millennial Sabbath uh, for all of those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and believe that God has raised him from the dead. So I hope in this series of teachings, you've been able to see how God uses as an author the concept of foreshadowing to bring dramatic emphasis, to develop the plot, to point to Jesus Christ as the theme of history, or as we would say, it's his story. And when we begin to develop the idea of prophetic foreshadowing, we see with greater clarity and detail the truthfulness of what Jesus Christ accomplished, how he did it, the details of his life, and we can, without mistake, see the fingerprint or the seal of God on the whole thing.